Recording in progress. Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Euh, je pense que vous verrez en anglais, parce que tu pourras lire en anglais, c'est sympa. Uh, so, good morning, everybody. Uh, we are here today to uh, uh, examine the PhD thesis work of uh, Rodrigo Siguero Siroma. Uh, my name is uh, Eric Leroy. I'm a senior scientist from CNRS, and I will be the president of the jury. So I will first present the members of the jury. Uh, first, the two uh, external uh, reviewers, uh, rapporteurs in French. Uh, so uh, uh, Virginie Mouillet, uh, who is a senior scientist uh, at uh, CRMA Méditerranée in Aix-en-Provence. Uh, Dr. Bernard Ofco, uh, who is professor at the Technology, uh, Technology University of Wien in uh, Austria. Uh, then, uh, Professor Frédéric Grondin, who is a professor at the uh, Ecole Centrale de Nantes, here. Um, professor Cyril Chazalion, Chazalion, who is a professor at Insta Strasbourg. Uh, engineer Cédric Soja, who is an engineer at uh, ENPPE, in Rouen-Rhin, in Allemagne. And then we have the, the supervisors of uh, the thesis work. Um, Meilan Nguyen, who is a junior scientist at the University of Eiffel here. And uh, Emmanuel Chailleux, who is a senior scientist at the University of Eiffel. So uh, now, um, uh, Mr. Siroma, you will uh, present your work in approximately 45 minutes. And it's entitled in French, Méthode expérimentale et théorique de détermination de la durée de vie résiduelle d'une chaussée à partir de ses bitumes extraits. So, you can present your I forgot to say that one member of the jury is not here today uh, because he has limitations in, uh, in Strasbourg. So we will follow the presentation and the question in uh, uh, the group of questions. Uh, Cyril, est-ce que tu nous entends bien Et je t'entends très bien, Rodrigo, merci. Ah, ok, merci. Et euh, est-ce que tu vois aussi le, la présentation en plan écran Oui, très bien, je vois la présentation. Merci. Ok, merci. Oui, je commence. So, uh, uh, thank you for giving me the floor, Monsieur Leroy. So I'd like to welcome everyone, everyone for being here. Thank you so much for being here, for showing up, come support me. Um, by the way, I know that some of you uh, that are connected via Zoom are joining us from different time zones. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, respectively. So I'd like to express my heartfelt gratitude to my advisors, Dr. Manuel Cheo and Dr. Melan Gwen. And I would also extend my gratitude to all the company members. So I'm Rodrigo Shigeru Shiroma. And today I'll be presenting my PhD work entitled Experimental Theoretical Methods for Determining the Remaining Service Life of Asphalt Pavements Based on the Properties of the Recovered Bitumen. So this is the outline of today's presentation. I'm going to start presenting the background, then the objective of my PhD work, and the methodology that was adopted to better address uh, the objective. Then I'll present the rheological characterization of bitumen, of bitumen samples that were aged both in the laboratory or in the field. Uh, uh, and among all the rheological properties, the phase angle matter cur curve proved to be very effective in tracking bitumen aging. So uh, we decided to apply mood variate statistical analysis to further investigate phase angle matter curve. And with the findings of this analysis, I could come up with a criterion that I 
to use to track a bitumen agent uh, named Molecular Agglomeration Index, or MAI. Uh, then I present the relationship of this new criterion with some asphalt mix mechanical properties, and finally, some con uh, conclusions and perspectives for future work. So roads are one of the major public assets due to its positive economic and social impacts due to our society. Um, however, this infrastructure can only provide these benefits as long as they are in satisfactory condition. But unfortunately, what happens is that our roads degrade over time. And to illustrate this, here we have this nice newly built section here that under the climatic and traffic conditions over the years, um, our roads tend to end up like this, well damaged. Well, in addition to climate and traffic, the degradation of our roads can mainly be due to the changes experienced by the material often used in road constructions, like bitumen, for example. Because, because of its nature, uh, organic nature, bitumen is susceptible to aging. Well, in this case, the reversible changes triggered by aging will lead to an increase in bitumen consistency over the years, which will cause asphalt mix to stiffen and embrittle. And consequently, we're gonna end up having our asphalt pavement that is now more prone to thermal and fatigue cracking. Well, bitumen has long been used as the main binding agent employed in road construction due to its desirable engineering uh, characteristics. And bitumen is this sticky black material that holds the aggregates together uh, that forms uh, the asphalt mix. And one of the bitumen's striking features is its viscoelasticity, which is uh, bitumen's behavior is highly dependent on temperature and loading time. Um, at, low, at high uh, temperature and long loading time, uh, visco behave like a visco liquid, whereas at low temperature and short loading time, bitumen will be behaving more like a, a solid or elastic like material. So, uh, due to the wide range of bitumen's uh, behavior, uh, complex models test has proven to be very effective in characterizing asphalt mix, as it, it, it encompasses a wide range of temperatures and frequencies, and they are closer to condition our asphalt materials uh, will be subjected uh, in the field under different climatic and traffic conditions. So frequent strip tests uh, show that for a pure elastic response, uh, there will be no phase lag or time lag uh, between the loading and the response uh, sine curve here, which in this case, uh, our phase angle will be equal zero degree. And on the other hand, we have a pure visco uh, material where our phase angle here, where we're gonna have 90 degree of uh, lag between the, the loading and the response. And in between, we find all the viscoelastic materials like uh, asphalt materials. And here we have the black space diagram for bitumen A. That, is, that was one of the bitumen that was used in, in my PhD work. And the, black, uh, the blue curve represent uh, the unaged bitumen, whereas the red curve represented the very aged bitumen here. So we can see that both curve, we can see that the uh, phase angle values varies from zero to 90. And as our material ages, uh, as our material ages, uh, there's a reduction in phase angle and which indicates a, uh, that our material is now harder and brittle and it, which is also indicates a more propensity to cracking. But what happened to bitumen chemistry and microstructure with aging? So uh, among the several models found in the literature, uh, the colloidal model seems to remain the most accepted model to describe bitumen structure, even though there are still some aspects to be understood. So according to this model, bitumen can be seen as a colloidal system uh, consisting of high molecular weight asphaltine micelles that is dispersed in this intermissular environment with lower molecular weight. So uh, from a chemical point of view, uh, bitumen has traditionally been uh, fractionated into four generic groups. Uh, we named uh, SERA, which is an acronym for saturates, aromatics, resins, and asphaltines. And we observe an overall increase in polarity as nonpolar uh, non polar saturates remain unchanged with aging. We have a reduction in, in lower polar uh, aromatics um, while we have uh, the increase of the most polar fractions, uh, resins and asphalt scenes with aging. So uh, the increased polarity will favor the, will, will favor the intermolecular agglomeration, um, especially the heavy ones such as the asphalt scenes, like the ones that we see here, the uh, agglomeration of asphalt scenes, uh, which will reduce the mobility between molecules and this will lead uh, to an increase in bitumen consistency in detriment of bitumen's ability to 
uh, disperse stress, which will increase bitumen consistency. And consequently, we're going to have a more a bitumen that is now more prone to cracking. So uh, the million dollar question is, uh, when does our bitumen reach the end of its service life? And to answer this question, it's worth mentioning the relentless pursuit of sound failure criteria, uh, indicating the lowest allowable performance level material can reach um, before uh, starting to present increased cracking propensity. And in this list, we can see some examples of empirical and chemical criteria that was proposed from the uh, late 60s to 2000, and also some examples of rheological criteria that have uh, currently been widely used. And the limiting values for all these failure criteria, they were based on the state of bitumen recovered on the surface of four uh, performing sections. And in this case, it's important to, to highlight the surface because um, we, th that's where we, 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 we get the uh, highest age intensity in our structure, well, according to the literature, and then we observe this intensity uh, decreasing with pavement depth. So uh, here are some two good examples of uh, some rheological-based failure, failure criteria, and they are point they are considered point parameter, and I will explain you why. Uh, here on the left we have the global rope parameter that was proposed by Geoffroy in 2011, and here we have the limiting phase angle temperature that was proposed in studies uh, that was conducted here in France in the late 90s, and in both cases, um, well, uh, despite uh, Although we have all the uh, rheological information here um, that is represented by the curves, we only look at one single value here at a given condition. For global row, it's at 15 degrees Celsius and 0 0.005 radian per second. Whereas for uh, here, actually, we have two parameters. Uh, we have temperature corresponding to uh, the phase angle of 27 or 45 degrees, uh, both at 7.8 hertz. And here, uh, and here I, I wanted to, to say, uh, to ask, and how about the shape parameters? Parameters that could take into consideration all the, uh, the domain, uh, the rheological domain, uh, the bitumen well, might suffer during the uh, uh, pavement service life. So in line with the motivation behind all these failure criteria of having powerful and reliable indicators uh, that are sensitive enough to track remaining uh, performance of our roads, uh, the Movedive DC project, well, Movedive DC is actually a French acronym that accounts for, uh, that, that stands for uh, Modeling of Aging and Damage for Pavement Lifetime Assessment. And this project aims to establish a methodology to better characterize uh, the residual mechanical properties of our, of our asphalt materials present in the base course. And the base course, uh, it's this uh, layer here below the surface course and the evolution of these materials uh, throughout the years. Um, which is fundamental to enhance uh, current approaches for calculating the remaining uh, pavement lifetime and uh, remaining, uh, yes, uh, lifetime and, uh, and maintenance solutions. So uh, here is worth mentioning that the MoveDB DC project has focused on base course because this is the layer uh, whose properties are taken into consideration um, uh, in, uh, in the French pavement design method to estimate the pavement service life. So uh, here we have the Move DC Research Consortium uh, that comprises four universities and four industry partners. So uh, as part of Move DC's uh, task three regarding bitumen analysis, uh, this primary objective of my PhD work is to evaluate the performance level of asphalt mixture based on the properties of, of their recovered bitumens. So here is worth mentioning that, for example, all the field aged bitumen I studied during my PhD they were taken from the asphalt uh, base course because of um, the objective of, of move the VDC. And to accomplish uh, this objective, uh, all the bitumens, both aged in the laboratory or, or uh, aged naturally in the field, uh, they, were per uh, they were characterized via semi-empirical, physical, chemical, and rheological testing. And then this allowed me to determine the most sensitive parameters to track aging. And with these most sensitive parameters, uh, estimating the residual performance of our mixes. So to better understand the aging phenomenon, um, the methodology that was adopted uh, is what we call mood scale approach to bitumen aging. Uh, we start off with uh, uh, scale one, that is a laboratory aged bitumen. So here we have our bitumen and it's 
uh, it's short uh, aged via RTFOT that represents the agent that takes place during uh, asphalt mix manufacturing all the way to compaction, uh, which is usually which is uh, uh, at high temperatures, uh, temperatures superior to 100 degrees Celsius. And this period we call we also call short term aging. And then this bitumen was further aged uh, via one and two times PAV that represents the aging that takes place throughout the pavement service life. So on a laboratory, uh, on, a, on an asphalt mix scale, we have bitumen recovered from uh, loose mix uh, that were aged in the laboratory. So in this case, um, I used the, the Ryland protocol that was that is described in De La Roche and coworkers. So here we have the bitumen that was after being heated, like minutes before uh, the, the, the mixing, we extract the sample. And then for short-term aging, we have the bitumen that was recovered right after the mixing and after four hours at well, 135 degrees Celsius. And for long-term aging, uh, we have our mix that was, that was aged, that was aged. In this case, it was loose mix and they were aged uh, for two, five, seven, nine, all the way to 20 days at 85 degrees Celsius. And the last, and the last scale of our, uh, of our approach was the field aged bitumen where uh, was bitumen recovered from the asphalt uh, course base. So here uh, is just a map just to, to, to present the location of each of these uh, carefully selected roads. Uh, and all these roads, they, what they have in common, uh, they have uh, their asphalt base cores formed by GB3 mix. And here, this photo is just to illustrate uh, what was done in each of these sections. So in each of these sections, um, asphalt mix was taken from the traffic zone, in this case, was in the right wheel path, and from untrafficked zone, which was between these uh, wheel paths. So this is the global overview of the methodology that I adopted to address the objective of, of my PhD work. So now let's move on to the rheological characterization of our bitumen samples. So in this case, a frequency sweep test at multiple temperatures were conducted via Metrovib dynamic mechanical analysis. And bitumen's complex models and phase angle, um, they were measured in tension compression mode at low temperature. Um, and at high temperature was in annular shear mode. Uh, the temperature, uh, the testing temperature range was from minus 15 to 60 degrees Celsius, whereas the frequency range fr was from uh, 1 to 80 hertz. And the conversion from G star to E star or vice versa was done using uh, Poisson's, ratio, uh, Poisson's ratio of 0 0.5. So uh, since bitumen were assumed to be a thermorheologically uh, simple linear viscoelastic material, uh, the limitations of laboratory testing conditions can be overcome in this case um, well, by, by constructing a unique master curve uh, that in this case is pretty much shifting each of these isotherm here and then uh, at, at a, well, from a, a reference temperature uh, that allows extrapolating the, the experimental data to conditions closer to, to those our asphalt mix are likely to be subjected during pavement service life. And here, this master curve was built using the mathematical method uh, proposed by Shayo and coworkers. Uh, the linear viscoelastic model used here to feed the experimental data was the, was the 2S to P1Z model, or two spring, two parabolic elements, and one dash plot proposed by Ollard and Di Benedetto, and which here is represented by this red line here. And we can see that it fitted quite uh, pretty good the, uh, the experimental data. And for bitumen, we consider that the static models or E0 uh, is zero. So, now here we have some results of bitumen A that was uh, RTFOT aged and one and two times PAV aged in the laboratory. So uh, for the, 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 the model's master curve here, uh, yeah, so I'm just gonna explain here this figure. So uh, the blue curve represents the unaged bitumen. The yellow one is the RTFOT aged. Black one is one PAV aged and red one is two PAV aged. Uh, I'm going to use the same color to represent the same aging condition so, uh, throughout this presentation. Uh, here, what we can see is an increase in models that can um, mainly be observed here at this region of low reduced frequencies for models. Whereas for phase angle master curve, uh, well, from a graphic point of view, uh, we can see that the phase angle seems to be uh, farther apart from each other uh, when compared to the model's curve. 
uh, which, which help us uh, highlight in the difference between each agent models. Uh, well, now I'm going to compare uh, the four agent states of bitman A versus uh, loose mix agent bitman AD and AL. Uh, bitman AD is pretty much a bitman that was recovered from a mixture composed of bitman A plus diuretic aggregates, whereas bitman AL was bitman A plus limestone. So uh, uh, the four, uh, here I use just four agent level that, that are represented by these dashed lines. Uh, this blue one represents the uh, bitumen that was heated minutes before mixing. Uh, the brown one represents uh, bitumen that was recovered right after uh, mixing. Uh, the black one represents uh, the, uh, the bitumen that was recovered from an asphalt mix that was aged for nine, nine days, and the red one for 20 days. So we have the same trend here. We, have that we, we observed that with aging, we have this flattening of the phase angle master curve. Uh, for both uh, bitmans as well that was recovered from loose mix agent. And now, well, the four agent level of bitman A versus uh, field agent bitman NB2T and NB3T from non-strafic zone. Uh, NB23 uh, was bitman taken from this intermediate uh, layer here, whereas NB3T was from the, uh, the deepest layer of our uh, structure here uh, in the manage. So, when we see the trend that, that was observed so far, we observe that the bitumen extracted uh, from the intermediate part seems to be uh, like overlapped on the RTFOT curve, sort of, whereas the bitumen extracted from the bottommost layer seems to be in a zone in bet uh, between RTFOT and one PAV aged. So in this case, it seems that bitumen from the bottommost layer appears to be more aged. Um, even though the overwhelming majority of the study states that aging is only relevant near the pavement surface, which, which would be here. And so, yeah, so here in this work, we observe that the bottom most layers seem to be more aged than the intermediate layer that is closer to the surface here. So now here's some takes, uh, takeaways of this part, uh, this uh, bio, uh, bitumen uh, rheological assessment. So um, the flattening of the curves indicates an increasingly elastic and less viscous material uh, with reduced re relaxation ability, which is often a potential indicator of increased cracking potency, uh, propensity. And from a graphical point of view, the phase angle master curve seems to, uh, since they are farther apart from each other when compared to uh, the complex models master curve, uh, so this seems to, uh, to better highlight the difference between HA agent level and with aging, uh, we could also observe that the phase angle master curve uh, flattens. Uh, in this case, well, the phase angle master curve flattens along a very large uh, frequency scale, um, which is uh, unlikely uh, the uh, modulus phase angle, where we only see uh, an, uh, an increase at the uh, lower, uh, low reduced frequencies. So the question is, um, where is the most relevant change can, uh, where is uh, in this case, the most relevant, to, uh, relevant change in phase angle master curve with aging? So to address this question, uh, we decided to use multiple statistical analysis on phase angle master curve. Because our first, first question was how to treat our data, how to treat phase angle master curve. Uh, in this case, well, uh, we have a principal component analysis or PTA. Uh, that has long been used in several uh, science, uh, science fields, including bitumen-related works, uh, to reduce the dimensionality of our data set with minimal loss of information, which, inc which helps increase in the, the inter interpretability of our data set. And since I just mentioned the previous slide, the variation of the phase angle uh, seems to take place in a very large range of reduced frequency, which would represent, in this case, well, hundreds of columns if you represent uh, data by data. Uh, to describe a curve, which is why in this case PCA was used, was to see, to select uh, what could be the most valuable, the most relevant information that could be used to be more representative to the whole uh, curve. So uh, phase angle proved to be uh, sensitive enough, in track, uh, enough to track the, uh, the, bit, the, the, the agent variation between different agent levels. And, and also, uh, unlike the models, uh, bitman phase angle seems to be little or no influenced by the Poisson's ratio. Uh, and this is actually a, a problem that we had in our project where we had different research groups uh, using different rheometer uh, apparatus 
uh, and we had some problem in trying to compare um, complex models, the models itself, but with phase angle it was way simple to, 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 to compare the, the values obtained from different research groups, from different rheometer as well. So in this case, uh, well, so the powerfulness of phase angle master curve, um, it, it, well, it seems to be uh, interesting since it allows the uh, high sensitivity of phase angle with the usefulness of master curve in extrapolating laboratory testing conditions. So here I'm gonna show an example here. I use the four agent level of bitumen A that I just that I presented before previously. And here I just put two more bitumens that I took from the literature, which is a unmodified 35 uh, pen grade bitumen from Temley and coworkers, which is TFR, it's T fresh and T mixing is right after mixing. So here each line represents each bitumen used in this example in this small part of my data set. And here the column represents the phase angle correspond uh, to each of these reduced frequency values. And well, these, uh, they are represented by the markers here on the curves. So uh, since we have three columns, we, we could represent this data set in a, a 3D graph. And if you had more than three uh, columns, that would be impossible to represent it graphically. So the first step of PCA in this case uh, here is our graph. So the first step is pre data preprocessing, such as mean centering. We determine the mean value here. And then we're gonna subtract the mean value from each column to reduce potential bias terms. So in this case, we, we mean centralize our data set here in the origin of this 3D graph. And then we're gonna determine the direction, uh, the best fitting line for PC1 uh, that goes through the origin in this case, they'll be able um, that will be able to, to, to account for the most variation around the PCs. So PC2 is orthogonal to PC1 and accounts for the largest variation that hasn't been considered by PC1. And finally, PC3 is a term likewise. Here we have three PCs and note that we have the same number of PCs as we have a column. So uh, here we have the, um, the relevancy of each uh, PC in to uh, in describing the, to, to describe the uh, our data set, uh, PC one in this case accounts for ninety seven point three percent. PC two accounts for two point six percent, and three uh, PC three for only zero point one percent. So in this case, we can delete PC one, and instead of having this three D graph, we can have a two D graph that is way easier to interpret it with ninety nine point nine percent of uh, the original data. I'm just going to make some room here. Yeah, so uh, the axis of PTA uh, scatter plot, they are line, a linear combination of the original variables. In this case, uh, these constant values that, mul that multiplies these uh, mean standard values, they are called loadings, or yeah, they're called uh, loadings in PTA, or, and the greater the, the uh, and the, the highest the uh, loading values, the, the greater the relevancy of the original values to the PTA. Uh, in this case, for PC1, the highest value is V2. V2 corresponds to this middle col uh, column here in the middle, whereas for PC2 is V3, that is the uh, rightmost column here. So also a very important part of PC analysis is the data selection. In this case, we had to determine what would be the uh, reduced frequency range where the significant variation of the phase angle was observed. So in this case, uh, uh, we, we got for every bitman, for each bitman that we, we get different agent level, uh, we get the freshest level and the most aged level. And we, 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 we took the difference between them to determine um, where we could observe the, mo the most relevant variation. And then we determined this uh, reduced frequency range here. And then to, to represent our curve, we, we set well distributed um, reduced frequencies values here. Um, in order to, to, to be more representative to the whole master curve. So here's one of the results of uh, PCA, which is PCR scatter plot. And this analysis was done using 59 bitumens. Um, it was actually more than 59 bitumens because 59 bitumens was the bitumen that was uh, supplied by the project. But in this case, I also uh, add more bitumens that I took from the literature review from some previous work. Uh, I just got this data set from these papers. So what we could observe already, I'm gonna explain this, this graph here, don't worry. Uh, okay, so the increase in the agent level goes from right to the left. Um, and here I draw the approximate path taken by each bitman as they age. 
Uh, here, what is interesting to note is that once each of these bitmen cross the vertical line here, we can see this inflection point that's, that takes place here. So it seems that we have two sort of trends as our bitmen agent. Uh, PC1, which is the horizontal direction, accounts for 93%, whereas the, the uh, PC2, that is the vertical direction, accounts for 3.7%, which, which, well, in total, um, this 2D uh, PCA scatter plot accounts for 96.7% of the overall variation. So here, just to, to make it clear, I'm just going to highlight all the uh, four agent level of bitmen A. Uh, here is where we have our fresh bitmen A. Uh, here is uh, the RTFOT agent bitmen A, one PAV and PAV agent. <clears throat> so we can see, we can clearly see this uh, uh, inflection that seems to take place here halfway to once we cross this uh, vertical axis. So now let's now let's take a look at the the PCA biplot to better understand the influence of the original variables on the position of each of these bitmen uh, on the PCA scatter plot. So now in addition of having all these individuals, that is, that is each individuals are the bitmen that was located on this PCA biplot. We also have these arrows represent the, um, the initial values. And the longer the projection uh, of this arrow on a given PC, the greater the, uh, its influence. So the longest arrows that we have are these three, which corresponds to the 10 to the power of minus three hertz, 10 to the power of minus uh, five hertz, and 10 to the power of minus seven hertz. So, um, when we do the, uh, the projection of this, we can see that both uh, 10 to the power of minus three and 10 to the power of minus seven, uh, it has significantly uh, influence on both PC1 and both PC2. Whereas uh, 10 to the power of minus uh, five seems to, to be practically overlapped on PC1 and has almost no contribution uh, to PC2. So we can also note that all these arrows they are pointing toward the right, which means that uh, if you had any of our phase angle values uh, at this at any of this corresponding frequency, our bitmen would move toward the direction pointed by the by by these arrows. But since we we observe that uh, with aging we have this overall flattening of the curve, so all the values that was used in this case reduced, which is why all the bitmen with aging they they moved from right to the left. So here is just to try to better understand the, uh, the inflection trend that we observed in this analysis. Here I put this uh, generic yellow marker here. So with aging, we observed that, first of all, we have this, uh, this marker who goes, that goes from the right bottom to the upper uh, left part. So this is, well, this happened because we have a greatest, uh, greater very, uh, reduction of phase angle values at high frequencies. And then this inflection could be explained uh, by now having a greater variation at, at, low, at low reduced frequencies. So just to, to, to facilitate the interpretation, here I translate uh, all this by plot thing into a uh, phase angle master curve. Uh, here we have the blue one represent the fresh bitumen A, uh, red one is two PAV aged bitumen A. Uh, and the, the orange curve represents the average, uh, the phase angle master curve that was drawn using only average values of each uh, of these uh, reduced frequencies that was selected for this uh, PC analysis. Uh, the dashed lines represents the uh, loading. Uh, the green one represents the PC1, which was the, uh, the most important uh, PT for our analysis, whereas the yellow one represents uh, PC2 loadings. So what we observed here was, was that, so before the inflection point, uh, we had a great inflection at higher frequencies. And after the inflection, we observed a great reduction at low frequencies. Uh, we observed that since PC1 peaks is here, so it means that this is the most relevant um, initial value that was used in this analysis, which corresponds to approximately 8.5 times 10 to the power of minus six hertz. Now let's jump to hierarchical cluster analysis which is usually a complementary uh, analysis that is done after PCA, where individuals here, they're grouped according to their similarities. In this case, in their distance between, uh, between them uh, in the PCA scatter plot. So here we go back to our uh, sample scatter plot here. Uh, so initially we consider that uh, each individual is a cluster and then we start merging together. And as we, we keep merging, uh, we also have the dendrogram here. Dendrogram is built where uh, the, the, 
the, the diagram is interesting because it shows that um, individuals that were merged together here at the bottom part of the dendrogram seems to be uh, they are more similar, or which is they are closer to each other in this uh, uh, dimensional plane. Then those who are merged together here at the uh, at the bottom part, which they are further away. So using this clustering analysis, uh, we managed to to cluster our bitmen into two clusters here. Uh, we have cluster one, the blue one, and cluster two, the, the yellow one. And in this example, uh, just to facilitate the interpretation as well, I color code each individual uh, using the global row parameter cracking um, classification here. The blue one represents bitmen that are that are that that doesn't display uh, increased cracking propensity. So they are all here in cluster one. In cluster two, we also have some blue markers here, but also we can also see uh, the uh, the green one represent bitmen that are on on damage onset according to the global parameters, and the red one represent bitmen that has already uh, that displays already a uh, increased uh, cracking propensity. So what we observed, well, uh, with PCA and HCA combined, was that PC1 uh, managed to arrange the bitmen on an uh, agent level basis. And the clustering um, well, it seems to be similar to the uh, global row cracking uh, uh, classification. So here are some partial conclusions. Uh, PCA uh, revealed the most relevant frequency of 8.5 times 10 to the power of minus six hertz for PC1, and effectively arranged the bitmen samples on an agent level basis, and represent the balance below and above this value, which resulted via inflection point. Uh, in this case, two trend was observed uh, before inflection, where we have seemed to have a greater uh, reduction at high frequencies, and after inflection, a greater reduction at low frequencies. And we also got the same trend observed for laboratory agent uh, lab uh, bitmen recovered from uh, loose mixed ages in the laboratory, and also bitmen samples extracted from from uh, the field which in this case, they were classified according to what we knew already, uh, what we knew uh, beforehand, uh, the uh, performance of their respective uh, asphalt mixes. Uh, in this case, also supplementary bitmen can be placed on PCA scatter plot just to assess their uh, aging level in terms of uh, the already existing bitmen. In this case, we could add more individuals, not interfering itself in the process, but just uh, adding the individuals just to see where it would be placed according to what we have already to date. And PCA and HCA uh, correspond satisfactorily with the uh, global row parameter. And now I'm gonna present the proposition of this new in, uh, aging index, uh, molecular agglomeration index or MAI. So our question was, uh, how could this finding be linked to microstructure? Uh, in the literature, uh, we can see that uh, a way to determine the uh, molecular weight distribution of a uh, material could be using the size exclusion chromatography or SEC. Uh, but this procedure, uh, they, well, it has some limitations that is uh, that can be found in, in the literature. For example, uh, chromatography columns, uh, they are not totally inert. Um, the molecular weight distribution of diluted bitumen, in this case, may not correspond to the actual molecular weight distribution of undiluted bitumen. And also breaking uh, weak bonds that could provide valuable insights uh, regarding changes that, that take place in bitumen as it ages um, could, uh, could make us lose uh, important information or important insights on, 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 on the aging phenomenon. And also uh, UV detectors uh, sensitivity seems to be highly dependent on the chemical species. Uh, in this case, there's, uh, there's the Delta method, which is a... Uh, uh, an alternative to overcome these limitations, uh, because the data methods uh, propose what, what the data method proposed is to estimate an apparent molecular weight distribution based on bitumen's rheology, and for this purpose, phase angle measure curve uh, has been used, and the data method has proven to be uh, very sensitive to aging in some previous publications. So uh, the hypothesis. Um, on which the delta method is grounded is pretty much uh, seeing bitumen as a mixture of monodispersed molecular weight species, where each of these species has a single relaxation frequency under which this species does not contribute to the mechanical resistance. So here we have two different situations. 
At low frequencies, we have only large molecules contributing to bitumen's mechanical behavior, and where, whereas small molecules, they are relaxed, which cause the uh, models to decrease and the phase angle to increase. And on the other hand, we have a situation at, a situation at high frequencies where not only large, but also small molecules will contribute which, to the global uh, uh, mechanical behavior which will cause uh, our models to increase and our phase angle to decrease. So uh, the data method, uh, the first step of the data method is to convert our frequency to molecular weight. And in this case, we use this, we use this equation that was pro first proposed by Zanzato and then was uh, well, also uh, was corrected by Temeli. Uh, then we calculate the accumulated molecular weight distribution because uh, the data method also considered that uh, phase angle master curve is proportional to the cumulative molecular weight distribution. And then we, we, deriva uh, we do the derivative of the cumulated molecular weight distribution to get the, finally, the, uh, to finally get the uh, component molecular weight distribution here. So just to illustrate what uh, this apparent molecular weight distribution looks like, uh, here I have, again, the four aging level of bitumen A. And when I use the data method, uh, here is what happens. So the blue, the blue curve that represents the unaged bitumen, it seems to have this uh, unimodal shaped curve here. And with aging, what we can see, uh, we can see that these small molecules uh, seems to, to be consumed to create these new high molecular weight populations here. And also, we also have the, the peak of this new population at around 2,000 grams per mole. And in this case, this could be, uh, well, this believed to be a molecular agglomeration. So the question was how to quantify this molecular agglomeration. Uh, in this case, uh, the, first, the first idea was to do some sort of uh, area, area age ratio. In this case, getting an area above a given value um, divided by the total area to get, well, what would probably be the incidence of molecular agglomeration. So the question was how to choose uh, MO in this case. MO was is this given molecular weight, just uh, apparent molecular weight. So, um, well, when we go back to the findings uh, that, that we got from PCA analysis, uh, we got that the PCA highlighted the reduced frequency of 8.5 times 10 to the power of minus 6 hertz uh, to be uh, the most relevant reduced frequency for PC1. And for PC2, this represented the balance below and above these values, which resulted in the inflection point that we observed, even though the uh, contribution of PC2 is very low, it's, uh, it was around 3%. And according to the data method, this, values here, this value here corresponds to 1,500 uh, grams per mole, which according to the literature, this corresponds to two times the molecular weight distribution of a single molecule, molecule of S14, according to Mullins. So in this case, uh, well, MAI uh, seems to estimate the incidence of S14 agglomerations. Here are just some individual S14 molecules just to illustrate. So now we go back to our initial idea and now we define MAI as being uh, the area above um, 1,500 grams per mole divided by the total area. And here we have bitumen AD and bitumen AL. Uh, bitumen AD uh, is bitumen with diorite and AL is with limestone, respectively. In this case, it's just their evolution uh, during long-term aging at 85 degrees Celsius. So here we can see an increase of uh, this is MAI versus uh, laboratory long-term aging duration in days. So here we can see an increase and the dispersion, well, apart from this one here, uh, we can see that the dispersion is not that, that big. So we can see uh, an evolution of these values here. And these lines here represent the MAI value for uh, RTFOT aged bitumens, also one and two PAV aged bitumens. So in a study that is underway uh, and it was accepted for the, the next ISAP conference, uh, we also uh, calculated the coefficient of variation with measurements conducted in two different laboratories uh, and it, where each of these research uh, groups, they, they were using different rheometers, uh, EDSR and also a metra Vibor DMA. And we could got that uh, the coefficient of variation uh, of Glover-Rho seems to be higher than the one got from MAI. 
for these four bitumen um, samples. So now I present the relationship of MAI with other bitumen-based uh, failure criteria here. We have MAI versus global row parameter, MAI versus uh, temperature corresponding to 27 degree and 45 degrees uh, phase angle at both at 7.8 hertz. And we can see that we have good correlations here. And we also uh, took advantage of the of this criterion of this criteria since they they had already a uh, LinkedIn value to determine our own. Uh, in this case, we could propose a tentative failure criterion for MAI of 0 0.58. Uh, this criterion could be um, well, uh, updated once we have more bitumen in our analysis. So the uh, partial conclusions of this part is that uh, by revisiting the data method with the PCA and HCA uh, findings. Uh, a new aging criterion could be proposed, which was the molecular agglomeration index. And MAI presents a satisfactory condition considering the whole phase angle master curve. Uh, MAI can be now directly computed from phase angle master curve. This work is now in progress. Uh, MAI has a better reproducibility in terms of other uh, failure criteria, well, such as uh, the global parameter. And well, again, this work will be presented in the next ISAP conference. And the tentative failure criteria of MAI equals 0 0.58 was proposed based on all the other rheological based failure criteria. Now I'm going to move on to the uh, MAI mixed relationship. So to, to, to characterize our uh, asphalt mixes, uh, we performed complex models, fatigue, and thermal, strain restraint, uh, thermal stress strain specimen test, or TSRST. And TSRST is a uh, a destructive test that is that has widely been used to assess low temperature performance uh, of asphalt mix, and this test is uh, this test is strongly dependent on bitumen aging level, and it underlines the fragility of asphalt mix, which is why uh, TSRST was used because well it's not that common having TSRST being used to 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 characterize the, uh, asphalt mix from the base course. So uh, here we have um, uh, just a photo of um, what happened. That, well, this is after the, the, the sample. Here we, have, we there's the, the cracking of the material. And then we we'll just, well, just uh, make them apart just to, to have a, a nice looking photo here. And what happened is this, well, our initial test, uh, our initial temperature test, it starts at, at 12, uh, 20 degrees Celsius. And then the cooling rate is 10, 10 degrees uh, per, uh, Celsius per hour. So as the temperature drops down, uh, well, th there will be this uh, cryogenic stress. Though these specimens will be uh, experienced, uh, and it will be registered uh, during the test until our specimen break. Then we get the uh, failure, uh, the the failure uh, st stress strength, and the failure temperature here. Those are the values that we will be using in this presentation. So. Uh, the thermal cracking propensity uh, seems to increase with aging as we observe a reduction of the um, fracture uh, strength and temperature. And this is illustrated by this uh, shift of the uh, this curve here toward the uh, warmer temperature. Oh, this curves it represents foraging level of loose mix uh, that were aged in the laboratory. This one here, the blue one, represents the bitumen after mixing. Uh, the yellow one represents after four hour aging. Uh, the black one represents after five day aging and the red one after nine days. So we can see this, not only we have this shift, but also we have the reduction of this uh, part here, which represents uh, that bitumen is still, um, is still some uh, ability of relaxing. Here you can see that the uh, accumulation of the strength, the stress happens right after the beginning of the test. And here we have the two curves, uh, two curves representing the two materials from the, uh, the uh, 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 not uh, section. Uh, the green curve represents the the, the mixture from the intermediate uh, uh, layer, whereas the uh, the black one represents the uh, asphalt mix from the bottommost part. So again, here we can see that the uh, asphalt mix from the bottommost layer uh, cracked at warmer temperature than the one that was taken from the intermediate course. Which again seems uh, it seems to be that the material from the nonce bottommost layer is more fragile, which is in accordance with what we observe in with the bitumen. And MAI also seems to have a strong relationship with the TSRST parameters. 
Uh, here we have fracture temperature versus MAI, as well as fracture strength versus MAI. And you can see an abrupt increase here uh, of this trend um, of the uh, fracture temperature and an abrupt drop uh, when these values get closer to the uh, 0 0.58 value that was the tentative uh, failure criteria that was proposed for the MAI. And just to, to inform that the black markers represent the uh, loose mix that was aged in the, in the laboratory, the green one was from non-section and the gray one was from Dijon. So now I'm gonna present some conclusions and perspectives for further work. So uh, phase angle mass curve uh, seems to be a powerful tool to assess bitumen performance as it combines the high sensitivity of phase angle and the usefulness of mass curve to overcome testing limitation uh, uh, testing limitations uh, conditions. Uh, PCA and HCA, uh, they reveal the most relevant changes that seems to take place in phase angle mass curve at zero degree reference temperature, uh, which is approximately at 8.5 uh, times 10 times 10 to the power of minus six hertz. And through, through these uh, mood period statistical analysis, we could also observe two regimes of aging. And in this case, when, when we revisited the data method using these findings, a new aging criterion could be proposed, which was the uh, molecular agglomeration index or MAI. Uh, MAI seems to estimate the incidence of asphaltine agglomeration from rheological properties. And well, based on other well-known uh, failure criteria, we could propose a tentative failure criteria of limiting value of 0 0.58 for MAI. And MAI, well, seems to well, present satisfactory relationship with, other, with the uh, main TSRST parameters such as uh, failure temperature and a strength temp uh, failure, sorry. Uh, here I have some perspectives for future work. So, the the first one is to further develop MAI and verify its reproduci reproducibility uh, using measurements obtained from different testing conditions, uh, also different types of bitmans like PMB, uh, RAP, among others, and so on, just to assess the soundness of MAI and other and also other aging sensitive parameters that was studied uh, in, in this PhD work. Also investigate the possible soil gel transition linked uh, with MAI or any other microstructural property of bitumen that could explain this uh, uh, inverse in the, in the trend that we observed. Um, also, as part of move uh, in line with the move DVDC project, um, we'll continue the linking between the uh, bitumen-based criteria with material performance from the field, and then monitor, uh, monitor and study the evolution of different aspects of asphalt materials of broad sections, along the time and depth to better understand the evolution of the aging gradient over time. To finally develop aging models to predict the evolution of aging sensitive parameters that takes into account well, volumetrics, uh, materials types and conditions to which our asphalt materials uh, may be subjected during pavement service life, such as traffic loading, climate conditions, and so on. And with that, uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs> So the first uh, first person to we will ask a question is uh, Dr. Virginie, Virginie Mouillet, uh, who is a senior scientist at uh, Serena Mediterranean. So thank you, Mr. President, for giving me the floor. I would like also to thank you, Emmanuel, for uh, inviting me to report with uh, physics. And finally, Rodrigo, thank you very much for your very clear and didactic presentation. I did appreciate a lot as much as your uh, physics manuscript. It was very pleasant to read and to follow from uh, all your approach and the different uh, step of your approach. I did appreciate a lot. It's very condensed, a lot of work you have performed, great scientific value, and you have uh, achieved a lot of uh, interesting uh, scientific uh, contribution. So um, I thank you for that and 
you have done a very nice work and uh, your findings are very, uh, very good and I think uh, you have uh, opened a new way to take care of uh, the, the aging. But I have still some questions, sorry. <laughs> sorry. So in particular, I, I have uh, two main questions. It's about the apparent molecular weight distribution. In fact, in your physics manuscript, I didn't understand, or maybe it's me, what it's not clear to me, your choice to consider apparent molecular, molecular weight distribution to take into account for uh, the colloidal system. Because it's, uh, for me, statistic, uh, it's, uh, you take into account only about uh, static uh, molecules and not a dynamic uh, system. And uh, the, the rheological data is from a more uh, a dynamic uh, system. Mm -hmm. So how do you make the, the link? Uh, uh, I don't know. But, uh, the link between, how do you consider, why do you consider apparent molecular weight distribution uh, linked to rheological property? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, these are very, very good questions. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so, well, the apparent molecular weight distribution was, was was proposed in this context where, because of this uncertainty that we have, and we diluted our treatment, and we don't know that what if the uh, molecular weight distribution that we get from this diluted treatment corresponds to the actual um, diluted material, which is why the Dalton method was proposed, because the Dalton method was, is actually based on um, that the rheological uh, behavior is intimately linked to the uh, molecular distribution of our material. So, of course, we have some hypothesis, and based on this hypothesis, we determine the apparent molecular weight distribution or the possible molecular weight distribution that could explain uh, the rheological behavior we observe. Uh, well, yes, well, yes, it works. Uh, well, yes, it, it works very well after. But it is uh, just that, uh, in fact, uh, the, the the mobility of molecules uh, is not uh, for me. I didn't see very much the mobility of molecules uh, inside the uh, well, the molecular weight distribution. It was more uh, static and not dynamic. But you are right. It works after. So maybe. It is, maybe the interaction and the mobility is taken is taken into account in this parameter or in the link done after. Uh, yes. So I, I have also another question. <laughs> I have another question, but it's what I, uh, maybe you have done a hypothesis, but what I, I do not understand, it's also you, you have taken bitumen uh, age in laboratory and bitumen age uh, in the field, but how you have made the link, because for the sample taken, taken uh, from a pavement, you do not have the bitumen uh, used. It's, it's so maybe there is, a, you know, I, I don't know the, how you make the link, because it could, uh, it could change. Yeah. According to the bitumen of the at the beginning, yeah. uh, but uh, but I'm sure you have the answer. You have uh, <laughs> no, but yes, actually this was one of the first questions uh, in the project because well, one of the criteria of selecting these uh, four road sessions that we got was to having maximum as maximum as information we could got from the original. Uh, properties of the, the material was used. And this was one, one of the problems. Well, we could have gotten the, the bitumen that was initially used in here in Nantes, but we, 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 uh, we lost the, uh, the sample. <laughs> but, too bad. Uh, yes, but in this case, what we did was trying to select bitumen of the same, with, with the same consistency, like initially consistency, which okay. corresponds to the 3550 pen. And it was only uh, unmodified bitumen? Or uh, yes, it? for unfortunately, yes, for field age bitumen was only unmodified. Why? And also, I, I have still another question. It's uh, when you say, uh, I don't uh, remember where, but in your manuscript about uh, the carbonyl index, mm -hmm. negative value yes. is not possible. No. <laughs> 
So I, I was just saying maybe to put zero or something, uh, yes. zero, but uh, not negative. And for the statistical approach, maybe it could uh, have an influence. That's, yes, yes. that's all. And also, uh, well, two more questions. Uh, you say about the field uh, age material of Nantes and uh, Montpellier. This is mm -hmm. a C-shape. Uh, okay, due to uh, the unbound layer. Uh, okay, no problem. But in fact, you didn't speak about the uh, pavement structure of Strasbourg, mm -hmm. that it also built on unbound granular uh, layer. Yes. So I don't know if it is uh, the same trend or or no or. Uh... Uh, it was actually because Strasbourg was the first was the first uh, section that we studied, and at that time we didn't realize this uh, inverse. Gradient. That's why we didn't went further into the analysis. Ah, okay. But yes, we, we we actually we we observed we first observed this trend uh, when we were studying the uh, the materials from Nantes because from Nantes uh, the two uh, the two uh, deepest layers they were made with theoretically the same as of mix. It was the same mix. They were just used to use different layers. And when when we when we first observed that the uh, bottommost layer was more rigid than the intermediate layer, uh, we thought that we we could probably like it would inverse the results. But then we, we ran again the test and we got the same results. And just to be sure, we got just the bottommost layer. We we cut it we, we cut it like uh, half uh, like in, uh, probably in the middle, and then we got that. The, Bottom, the bottom of this uh, layer was more rigid than the uh, top part of this layer, which uh, validated our observation of this inverse uh, aging gradients. Okay, no, it is uh, interesting, but uh, uh, yes, uh, and also uh, for for uh, the PCA, I was I have just an observation because I have done PCA but a long time ago, but on your two PCA axis. The second one with three percent, yeah. so in fact, he didn't explain a lot. So, but after you, you did explain very well because, in fact, all your PCA score you use from the PCA one. Mm -hmm. So, on, oh yes, it, yeah. it, it was just. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, my, my last question: It's uh, in your manuscript you say that bitumen P. You have made a comparison between bitumen P and A bitumen mm -hmm. yes A about uh, the sensitivity of uh, aging. But you, you didn't explain why uh, bitumen P seems to be uh, more, no, less uh, sensitive to aging compared to bitumen A. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, yes, you're right. Well, actually, it's it, just in chapter four that I, that I present bitumen P because this is the polymer of polymer well, bitumen. Yeah. And yes, and the, most, the uh, overwhelming part of my, my work was done rather on unmodified bitumen. Mm. But yes, yeah, well, it was just based on, on the, the properties that was observed, yeah. that we could observe that according to the, uh, this aging indicator, the aging that is used is often tri aging. Mm. It seems to be that bitumen P seems to evolve slower than bitumen A mm. in terms of its parameters. But oh, yeah. yes, of course, they could have been. Yes, set. so you cannot say it's because of the polymer or it's not the same base bitumen or. Uh, no. No, it's uh, just an observation. Yeah, it was rather an observation. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because it could be also yes, uh, interesting. Yeah. And uh, the the evolution of property uh, of uh, bitumen A in P with aging uh, compared to uh, the limestone aggregate, you say it mm -hmm. it is mitigate the evolution. You think it's uh, the reason is uh, about uh, what to use? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that. It's because of mineralogy, mineralogy of the aggregates. Uh, I couldn't find. I, 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 I could. <clears throat> I could come across some words where it was said that limestone aggregates seems to mitigate of the evolution of aging. But, but again, well, it's aging through these uh, parameters that we often use to assess. So, but I couldn't. Find why, well, what could be the reason why this mitigates? It's maybe a, a problem of interface or yes. uh, an interaction between aggregate and bitumen. Yes. Yeah. 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 Y
I don't know chemical species. I don't know, but uh, yes, he, uh, there is uh, some uh, finding about this. So thank you very much for the review. It was a very nice uh, manuscript and also your presentation. I uh, appreciate uh, a lot and uh, you have done very uh, good uh, scientific assessment and I think it's very useful for the scientific community. I did appreciate a lot because it was about aging and uh, you have done a lot of uh, very nice work. It's very innovative and uh, I did like uh, your approach uh, at the multi-scale uh, multi from uh, chemistry, rheology and also statistical approach. So I think it, it's a nice way. So congratulations very much for your work and I wish you a very brilliant uh, career and I am sure you will uh, have it. <laughs> Thank you very much for this. Thank you. Uh, now uh, we will have questions by uh, Professor Bernard Opro. Thank you very much, Mr. President, for the floor, and also thank you, Leonardo, for inviting me to be member of this board. Honored to be here, and uh, it was a pleasure to read your thesis, Rodrigo. It's a very, very nice uh, and comprehensive thesis. There's a lot of experimental work behind it and people who are working in the lab, I think, can appreciate how much work that is. And then you did not only have the experimental work, what is also outstanding, I think, in your thesis is how you link the different levels and the different tests that you did, uh, new concepts with test data. Uh, I also enjoyed uh, your interpretation of the statistical analysis, because I think it is used in a lot of works, but never properly interpreted, and I think you you managed to do a good work uh, in interpreting complex data. Uh, so congratulations on this manuscript. Of course, I also have some questions. <laughs> That's why we are here today. Um, maybe I'll start with a very basic one because uh, I was not sure if, if um, the definition was very clear to me and we can talk about this. So your work is about aging, uh, of course, but there is also the mentioning of damage, which is always an, an inher inherent part of the structure. So my, my first question would be, how do you separate aging from damage? And how is then again, aging and damage linked to each other in our materials? Very tricky one. <laughs> oh. uh, I guess it depends on the material. For example, for the bitumen, uh, we couldn't it, neither for a uh, asphalt mix, because uh, as you could see probably in chapter seven, where I present the uh, results of asphalt mix uh, using some uh, parameters that, that, that is used to, 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 to track the aging level, we, we also saw some possible influence of damage in our material. For example, for uh, the global parameter for mix, where instead of have, uh, having our material uh, following the uh, the well-known trend, we also we see some detour. So, and this detour, when we look at this material, we realize that not only they have, uh, also that there's also volumetrics that, that, that is also taken into account in this analysis. But uh, this, this detour uh, corresponded to the material that seems to be a more advanced uh, damage level among the four uh, road sections. So yeah, it's very complicated to, to, to distinguish between aging and damage. And for bitumen, well, we, we can only get the uh, final result, which is the combination of these two, but we can't quantify exactly the, uh, the contribution of each into the uh, final result. So uh, yes, that's, that's, that's <coughs> a good first point. Let me, let me continue here. Uh, if you talk about aging, does aging alone, if you just age the material, we are just talking about bitumen, no other materials. I mean, if you talk about aging, we could talk about a lot of things. If you talk about aging of bitumen, does aging of bitumen alone already induce damage to the material? Or is there something else needed in addition to aging to then come to a state of damage? Yeah, of course. Well, I believe that aging is just uh, the change that happened naturally uh, in our material and well it's like human beings and as we get in age also we get more susceptible to 
external environments that go on. But uh, yes, I think that, and I think that the uh, aging well, caused the material to well increase the uh, the, the hardening. Uh, maybe. No, no, no. I, 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 I'm completely following your line. It's, it's, it's no, yeah, perfect. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but, but what I want to say is that, uh, well, uh, since now we get a material that is less uh, able to, to express stress, so any other environment, environmental or trapping this damage, <laughs> uh, they are, well, our material are more prone to, to all these elements combined. Yeah. I, I, I very much like your, your, your figure of speech talking about human beings and <laughs> external <laughs> effects just have a stronger impact on aged materials. Yes. Yeah. 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 Unfortunately for us, we experienced that. Okay, so moving on from that, um, I wanted to, there, there are some, some questions, maybe they are in the manuscript and I forgot, but I, they came up again when you showed that. So you did your extraction of the layers, of base layers, mm -hmm. and how did you take the complete base layer for binder extraction, or did you cut it into layer, thinner layers? Uh, actually, yes. I don't know if I, if I put this figure in my manuscript, but uh, the initial of this section, we extracted, it was a 40, 40 by 60 centimeter slabs. Yeah. Well, it was around 400 to 500 kilos of these slabs. So with each of these slabs, well, we, set, we, we slice all the layers to ensure that we will be getting only the material that integrates this layer, not, not like back coat or any other face. Yeah. Uh, but you did use the complete base layer, so all mm -hmm. eight or 12 centimeters. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. So, yes. Uh, did you have the chance to try? Uh, because I think you said for one of the for one of the layers you cut it into two. Um, maybe just a comment here. It would be very interesting if you had the chance to cut it even into smaller layers yes. to make sure that this C-shaped uh, curve that you find, which is highly interested interesting, uh, is can be validated. Yes. Um, and talking about the C-shaped curve that you found for at least some of your layers, um, what's your What's your hypothesis? Why do we have higher aging levels on the bottom of the of the bound layers again compared to the middle? Um, I think that when we see our um, asphalt pavement as a not just being hypo hypothetical, we're just giving us a unique material. Uh, we have we have uh, uh, how do you say that? Uh, we have, oh, I forgot the word. But well, we have the influence of external um, events. Well, on the top, we know that we have uh, well, oxygen and also other traffic. But in the bottom, uh, we barely know what actually happens in the bottom of our structure. Because in pretty much all Asian related study, we always look at on the surface. And not more than that. Well, sometimes we go a bit deep, but not too much. Not to see what really happens is really happening at the bottom part of our structure. Which is why I think that there might be uh, well, numerous hypotheses. There could be uh, well, oxidation, for example, for these um, unbounded layers. Uh, we could also have, let's say, water table ground. Um, I don't know. There might be countless factors. Yeah, yeah. But it might be oxygen species from from below, even even not only gaseous species, but even uh, uh, you know if, if you have a higher water level, uh, that you have some oxidative species uh, dissolved in water that could be interesting mm -hmm. yes. for the long period of time. Um, moving on to your FDIR, and FDIR is always very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I have, I think I have to emphasize again the thing with the carbonyl. I mean, it's only one, yes. but it's a. I think it's a point where in the in the future work, please yes. make sure that we start at zero, just to because it's just physically impossible, and it would <laughs> it would bias your very nice model in a way that is not necessary. Um, but 
you did also anal analyze um, polymer modified binders with, I guess, SDS modification. Mm -hmm. How did you work uh, around the, or did you find any problem or bias with uh, overlapping uh, uh, bands, especially in the sulfoxide region and the 966 of the uh, polybutylene, polyfluorine, one of them? It's funny, um, I, I have read about it, but in our case, we, I don't remember having any problem of overlapping, mainly with oxide because yes, that's the, uh, the most known uh, FTR index that could be overlapped for yeah. polymer yeah. modification. But in our case, I don't remember having any problem with overlapping, but I have to check that. Okay, okay, yeah. Because just, I mean, if you continue to use the sulfoxide index, and you might have changes in the in the SPS amount, which can also happen with aging. And then you have a, you have a ten. I think you're doing a tangen tangential yes. um, integration. Then this might get a quite a high bias into your into your sulfoxide index if that's what if, if that's a part of what you're using. Um, and then more of a practical question. Mine a detail, but I'm interested because we are only doing measurements in reflectance, and and I think what I read in your thesis was that you did it in transmission, but you did not dissolve the binder. Uh, you you were able to spread without dissolving such a thin binder film that you get transmission. Uh, yes, in this case, I had to heat up the binder. Uh, it was the uh, the link, the KDR link at up to it was 100. But it was very hard. Well, oh. it required me lots of techniques. At the beginning, I got this very saturated uh, spectrum, oh. and then I start getting more <laughs> readable spectrum. But yes. Okay. I agree. <laughs> yes, because I, 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 the only thing I come across when I read about transmissive uh, FDIR on bitumens, I always find that it's dissolved and then waited for the, the solvent to evaporate. Um, <laughs> And that is sometimes tricky because you never know what happens when you dissolve a bitumen. Okay. So I was maybe I can we can talk about this later, about the technique that you used because I would be interested to try. It. Oh yes, it's very nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, uh, let me see. Yeah. The, the apparent molecular weight distribution and the whole the thesis behind it. Um, I very much like the idea. To me, and maybe I don't have the complete literature because I'm not familiar with that too much, but to me, there is a missing link because between the data that you're presenting from the face angle master curve, which looks logical, but is there any experimental validation, direct experimental validation where you can reproduce a curve that is similar or comparable to the apparent molecular weight distribution that you get? Uh, I think it's very complicated because, for example, as you see this, it's very it's highly dependent. It's highly dependent on the procedures, the, uh, uh, the solvents, and uh, each parameter might, might affect on the uh, resulting uh, molecular weight distribution. But uh, we have this work that is under, uh, that is uh, ongoing work uh, where uh, we got, we've done some some SEC just to see with, with the four with four bitmaps that were used in in my in my, in my thesis and even though we don't have exactly the same curve we can see the same trend we can see even the same rank when we consider uh, the incidence of higher weight molecules so we can see that well at least we're going to the same direction but it doesn't mean that we're gonna have the same spectrum or the same distribution we need to think more about it to to, to see how we're gonna get this missing link yeah so there is ongoing work we're gonna wait yes. for a publication on that yes yes if they present okay. on, on the next slide. <laughs> um maybe coming to a conclusion here as well to give other people the time for questions um what i so I like the multi-scale approach that you have start with the binder level and then you still in the end include uh, S-filled mix level. What I found tricky 
is that in the usual approach, because you only looked at base layers, and I understand now why you are looking into base layers only. So usually when you think about pavement design, what you are interested in regarding long-term durability of base layers, it's stiffness and fatigue resistance. And then in the end, you don't show stiffness and fatigue as a link with the MAI, but TSRST, which I think is a very logical approach because TSRST is very sensitive to aging. But um, is it is TSRST also something that you think is a is a is a source of damage for base layers, or do you have the intention, or is in the project the intention? of uh, expanding the analysis to stiffness or fatigue related parameters? Okay, so very good one. Well, <clears throat> as I mentioned in the presentation, um, we also perform uh, complex models and proceed tests on our uh, asphalt dimensions. And funny part is uh, with aging, models and fatigue seems to increase. So when we put these increased values in our uh, equations to, to predict our pavement lifetime, we got this pavement that will last for hundreds of years, which is not real. <laughs> so, which is why we decided to use TSRST, even though it was for these course materials, because at least uh, it's a, it's a uh, mixed performance that could, that it seems to be more sensitive to, 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 to the binding effects, uh, to the changes in the binding that is used. Because with fatigue and well, many models, which uh, we models tests were, were done here uh, back in the city study tech. Uh, we observed this increase in models that uh, we, we didn't, we, we, we just don't understand how this increased value could be used, for example, to estimate the remaining service life, which is why we start looking at other uh, tests to see if this would also validate or correspond the level, the, uh, the performance level of our correct agent material. Yeah, yeah. Um, regarding aging and fatigue and the increase of, of fatigue life with aging, the, the two-point bending that you're using for fatigue is also um, 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 not stress, uh, not stress, driven, but uh, deflection driven, right? So it's the same as we use for the four point bending. And I think this is the inherent problem because in fact, we always have the same loading. So this, it should be the same stress situation. But what we do is we assume it's the same deflection that we get. But once we get aging and we get stiffer materials, they will not deflect the same, but they will attract more stresses. So I think if we considered a fatigue-based test, and there are fatigue tests that are stress-driven, uh, then we might see different results after aging, that aging does, in fact, reduce our fatigue life. Mm -hmm. But of course, I, I mean, we have the discussion in Austria, now we have a lot of data on the four-point bending. <laughs> no one wants to move away from a, from a methodology that we use for mixed design. It's just, a, I think, more a scientific question to think about how we can take that into account for aging and fatigue uh, when we look into base layer uh, aging. Yeah, I think I'm, 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 I, there are more questions because it's such a, such an expensive um, thesis that you have, but um, I think that were the most pressing questions. Again, of course, we're looking now into those small little details that are maybe questions, but in fact, again, congratulations, very interesting and very, well done scientific work and also from my side, all the best for your future, which will be bright uh, uh, professionally speaking. Thank you. And I hand back to the president. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so now uh, we will have uh, questions from uh, Professor uh, Cyril uh, Chazalon. Uh, Cyril, are you still with us? Yes, yes, I'm still here. Uh, thank you. Mr. You very well, you can ask your questions. Okay, thank you, Mr. President. 
So first of all, I, I join my colleagues and I would like uh, to congratulate Rodri Rodrigo for the work uh, done during these uh, three years and a half, maybe. Uh, we meet, uh, I met Rodrigo first, it was uh, four years ago at uh, Fortaleza at ISA conference. And uh, since that day, you, 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 work, you work a lot, you, you, you've done a very good job in the, in, in the field of, um, in the, of the project, uh, Move DVDC. You joined the project in 2019, and um, I witnessed that you were very active during the project and take part to the work packages uh, two and three. I think uh, yeah, I was really uh, astonished to see the results you can obtain with the statistical analysis you, you perform on your test. It was really a great job, and um, again, uh, congratulations for your, for your work. I really appreciate to, to have some exchange with you during the, <clears throat> these four years. And I uh, wish you all the best for the future. <clears throat> I have no more questions. As I, take, as I was involved with uh, Rodrigo in the same project, and we have already discussed uh, a lot of time. <laughs> so thank you, uh, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, so um, now we will... Uh move to questions uh, from uh, Professor Frédéric Grondin. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> Rodrigo, so uh, your contributions for this ambitious work, and uh, you have given numerous results. So, uh, but sometimes uh, I search for, for um, explanation uh, concerning the, the choice of your methods. So I have two free questions about that. Um, first of all, uh, when you have selected um, the real bituminous specimen in uh, five months, so uh, my question is, uh, is it necessary to extract the full depth specimen in place of um, representative elementary volume of this uh, pavement? Mm -hmm. So after your work now, did you suggest to uh, to, to extract the full depth, or maybe you can uh, analyze uh, the behavior only with um, a small specimen. Uh, you mean for bitumen or asphalt mix? Because, for example, uh, bitumen, the problem of bitumen extraction is that uh, since asphalt mix are made up with around 4 to 5 percent of bitumen, so we need this very large amount of asphalt materials to get the very little <laughs> tin of bitumen, which is why we need to get, for example, uh, we needed a 10 kilo of bitumen to get around, I don't know, I remember, but 100, or it was pretty nice, like 50 grams of bitumen that could then be used for all the uh, testing. So also, um Concerning the, the PCA, so the principal component analysis. Um, so uh, uh, it was difficult to, to understand in the, in the manuscript, but in the presentations, you have given a synthetic presentation of the analysis, and it was better. So maybe you, you can have this, make this uh, presentation in your final manuscript, because uh, it's, uh, it's uh, now easy to understand the separation of the, of the different behaviors, the different components, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe you can have it in the manuscript. It would be better to understand. Um, so also, I have a question concerning the Dandogram. Uh, so how did you select the Dandogram result? So did you try to different results to observe different behavior? Yes. Uh, uh, to be honest, before working with both various of two analysis, I wasn't familiar at all with this type of analysis. And it was funny because when I was writing, I realized that, for example, a clustering is something that is very, um, is directly related to the technique that is used. That is not even like uh, use a like the technique, but it's rather uh, you, you're using a given library. For example, I used in R Studio. And depending on the library, uh, we could get different clustering. Well, overly speaking, we would have the same trend, but 
is the same for the clustering because so you to determine the number of clusters, it's up to you to decide where you're gonna cut off the uh, dendrogram. And again, there's no clear criteria for that. It's pretty much based on your uh, previous experience and also knowledge on uh, the study known. So it's very, that's why this needs to be very uh, well described in order to, to be uh, easier to be able to know the, the results. Because we know that all the people have to of the procedures to the results. So maybe you have found a method. There are several <laughs> methods. Uh, concerning the thermal stress test, mm. uh, so you have shown, shown that uh, there is uh, an effect of age mm -hmm. on the, the stress, the, the failure. So uh, did you measure also water saturation in different specimens? Uh, no, but actually uh, we we conditioned our, our specimens in 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 draft uh, in, in draft oven in order to, to have the maximum evaporation as possible in order to not have any water to interfere in our final results. So there is no ice formation in no. this. No. Theoretically no. Thank you. That's all. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, now we will have a question by uh, Cédric uh, Sozea. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, thank you to the supervisor for inviting me to participate in the jury. Um, first, uh, I want to congratulate uh, uh, you, uh, Rod Rodrigo, because uh, you did a great job in analysis and in uh, testing a lot of materials from the samples. Um, and uh, the second uh, congratulation is uh, for your presentation, which was really clear and uh, didactic. And I uh, joined my colleague who says that the, the part where you explain the analysis in the principal component was really clear there. And not so clear yes. in your manuscript, <laughs> or maybe clear but uh, yeah. not uh, easy to read. Yeah, <laughs> um, yes. Uh, first, first, uh, there is something that marks me when I, when I uh, read your your manuscript, and I would like you to show the slide uh, seventeen, I think, so that we can discuss. This one, yes. So from this slide, it, you can say that the phase angle decrease due to aging. But uh, I don't completely agree with this simple uh, conclusion. Okay. If you look at the radius frequency, obviously it decreases. Mm -hmm. But if you look at what is interesting for this material, that means uh, frequency, of uh, so loading solicitation, mechanical solicitation, mm -hmm. but also temperature. Yes. And at that time, with this graph, you, you can conclude if for one temperature, mm -hmm. the, the phase angle will, will, will decrease or increase. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yes. Because behind this curve, there is another uh, parameter that is uh, hidden, mm -hmm. and it's the shift factor. Yes. And nowhere in your manuscript you speak about this factor. Oh, the shift factor, yeah, the yes, shift. and its evolution with the aging. So, mm. ca can you comment or? Uh, I actually, yes, I, I remember that in the beginning of my work when I was trying to evaluate the changes caused by aging, rather by uh, looking at the evolution of each of the two SFP1 parameters. Uh, I was also looking at this uh, shifting factor below the uh, WFL method and I remember seeing that there was a very consistent increase I think I don't remember if it was C1 or C2 but uh, to be honest I, I don't have this 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 material off the top of my head but yes you're right when when you say that the uh, model curve cannot say that 
the splattering was just because of aging. But when we look at the experimental data that was measured uh, at the same condition, at the same uh, uh, frequency and temperature, we saw that there is a overall reduction on the phase angle in all these uh, conditions, uh, at least with our materials, which is why we could, well, we could conclude that it was, well, the only thing that changed was aging, but you, you also write about the, uh, the shifting factor, the, uh, the metric curve construction, because it's highly dependent, it's highly dependent on, on the shifting factor method that we use. This could flatten more our curve or less, so. I agree with you. That's why I asked you the 17, yes. uh, the 17 uh, slide because yes, yes. if you go at the 16, you have the point and yes. the experimental point on the 16 uh, slide. Uh -huh. And at that time, you can see that there is a reduction. But uh, yeah. with only this curve, if you just uh, and I, I was surprised that you didn't comment about the the, the shift factor uh, or the aging effect on the shift factor. Um, maybe. Um, Yes, a comment and uh, some question, but uh, to go beyond your, your, your work. Um, so you analyze uh, really deeply the evolution of the curve, uh, of the phase angle curve. Uh, you did the principal uh, component analysis. But in the end, I wonder, yes, OK, it's nice, but uh, what can I do with that? And if, 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 I, if I think, mm -hmm. I, I would say, OK, you describe perfectly the evolution of the shift of the phase angle in function, uh, uh, the phase angle in function of aging. Mm -hmm. So now the next step is uh, modeling. Yes. So to develop a model to say, OK, I, I have this, uh, this phase angle uh, curve for a uh, virgin bitumen, and uh, how this curve will evolve in function of aging. But then, uh, what, 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 which, uh, which parameter will you use as input mm. of your model yes. to describe the, the aging evolution? Not the output, yes. the output could be the phase angle, the, the complex modulus, but as an input, what should you use for the model? I don't know, time, uh, temperature, certainly, but uh, what else? Can you use? Yes. You mm -hmm. mean like what could be the input that will that will provide us with the uh, aged curve that we got? Right? What was that the question? Uh, to 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 get how would you uh, describe the aging uh, level mm -hmm. of the material? Not the output uh, uh, parameter, which could be the phase angle, but what would be the input? Is it the life duration of the bitumen? Is it the, I, I don't think it's sufficient because there is a, obviously temperature that would play a role. I think it's a, it's very complicated to, to, to for example, directly correlations between, uh, I would say bitumen performance and, for example, um, in the end of chapter four, I tried to, to compare uh, the, uh, it was some sort of correlations between uh, bitumen recovered from loose mixed aged and pure aged bitumen uh, with the four uh, aging level of bitumen A, which was fresh, for example, T1 PV to PV. And what was funny was that depending on the parameter used, we could have different classification, for example. Mm -hmm. so, I, I, I don't know, but I'm not sure actually if, um, in this case, we observed that, yes, of course, phase angle seems to be very sensitive, and this is also well studied in the literature, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure what else to do as a input. Okay, uh, another question to uh, maybe to, uh, to precise. Uh, <clears throat> if you go to the next slide, I think, you show, you show that there is different level of aging in function of the depth of the material. Mm -hmm. How do you explain that? Oh uh, yeah. Well, that was a that was a question that. that is it is it due on. to the different level of temperature? I, I, honestly, uh, I don't think so. But uh, is it the uh, availability of uh, oxygen at the different level? Mm -hmm. 
movie. Yeah, so this was actually the thing because, well, apart from this word here, uh, Omari, I, I, I couldn't find any other word where they, they said that he is he's, uh, more rigid material, the bottom part of our material. Which is why, because most of this work, they, they always focus on, on the, the bitumen that is on the surface here on the wearing course. And it was funny because, uh, because uh, in this case, it was because we have this French context of uh, taking into consideration the parameters uh, from our base material that we could detect this change. But the, the thing is, we, we still couldn't come up with good answers for to explain this. This could be uh, several uh, countless factors combined together, and it's just the beginning, I think. Okay. It merits it to, 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 to be further investigated. I agree with you on that. <laughs> then, uh, um... Uh, I won't speak about the the, the mass uh, the, the the weight of the molecular analysis. Uh, I share the, the, the same doubt, and uh, everything rely on uh, an hypothesis that for me is still an hypothesis, but uh, uh, and uh, needs to be demonstrated. Uh, I will speak about the what said uh, Bernard about the the relation between aging and uh, damage, and uh, I will do it differently. I will just look at the the title of your PhD, and if you read the title of your PhD, so you it's experimental and theoretical method for assessing the remaining service life of asphalt pavement based on and I would uh, add only on <laughs> the properties of its recovered bitumen. Mm. So when 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 I read that. <laughs> I say uh, good luck to the students that would uh, do that. <laughs> and if it, uh, behind that is, uh, is it really uh, possible to just explain what happened in the pavement and uh, maybe damage only with bitumen aging? Because this is what you what you did. Yeah. Well, actually, uh, that, that's what I was. Uh, that, that was my answer. But I think that. Uh, this managing plays a very important role, but again, well, we have countless factors that impact and we don't know how to quantify the contribution of each of these parameters. We know that well, uh, this managing has an impact, but we don't know how much. Uh, uh, you, you could add uh, a part to your answer, mm -hmm. which is the last part of your study. Mm -hmm. When you correlate uh, TSRST test results with aging, mm -hmm. because TSRST is uh, a test to characterize the cracking yes. at the surface of the pavement due to uh, temperature uh, yes. evolution, of course. And this is a way to damage the, the pavement. Mm -hmm. So at least you, you have correlate the aging of the bitumen yes. with this type of distress. Yes. Um, last question, uh, maybe still tricky, but uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> you speak about, uh, you, uh, you never, or maybe you did, but sorry, uh, I miss it, but you never speak about uh, RAP, no. <laughs> Reclaim Asset Payment, no. in your PhD. Uh, and this uh, aging problem, is directly linked with uh, the use of RAP, in fact. Mm. My question is, do you think that aging is uh, a reversible phenomena or not? Reversible phenomena? Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, from that, uh, and knowing the, the use of RAP in, uh, by industry, mm -hmm. uh, the solution to, 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 to make the the, the old the, or the aged bitumen becoming a new bitumen. Mm -hmm. uh, could you comment? Well, to be honest, I didn't learn much about rejuvenator, but I know that they, they have this purpose to, to, to reuse wrap. So. And in the framework of Move DC, we had, I think, two sections where the bottom part of the base course 
was made of bread. Uh, yes, it was a Strasbourg and Dijon. So Strasbourg was yeah, 40 percent bread, and Dijon was 10 percent. And in this case, well, I don't remember it because I, I don't remember the uh, the original documents, but I remember that for example for Strasbourg, they had used a software basement. It was a 7100 uh, and basement to mix with well, to, to do the formulation with bread. So now to be honest, I, I don't know much about the general properties. Uh, even without rejuvenator, uh, when you want to use wrap, you, uh, you, you mix uh, old bitumen with uh, a new one that is softer, mm -hmm. sometimes uh, much more soft. Mm -hmm. But uh, yes, is it enough? So can we consider that the bitumen that we get, the, the, the blend between these two bitumen is uh, the same as uh, the virgin bitumen that we would have used or, or not? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and to be honest, I have no idea. I've never worked for a factory. But, uh, um, what I could say is that um, to, for, for mixing the uh, mix, mix that was aged in the laboratory, uh, the procedure that was, that, that was used, uh, the one that the, the Ryan protocol was actually developed for uh, simulating breath. So in this case, we have this loose mixed age that is uh, mixture age that is uh, aged loosely, and then I remember that we had very we had well we have some problems during compaction, for example, which is which to explain the uh, higher uh, airborne content at the uh, most aged most uh, aged um, asphalt mix that was the one after nine days that I presented in chapter seven. So. When trying to overcome the situation, our alternative was using higher compaction temperature, depending in order to to attain the same equiviscosity. But we saw that for nine days it wasn't enough. Well, we still had the same problem when it was in compaction, which apparently impacted, well, might have impacted in any other mechanical properties of asphalt mix that we observed. Okay, uh, I will finish. So <laughs> thank, thank you for your answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, no, I will ask uh, questions myself. Um, first, uh, congratulations for your uh, your work, for the manuscript, and uh, even more for the presentation. Uh, I was impressed by your lecturing skills because uh, the, pre the way you presented the, the principal component analysis was uh, very clear. <laughs> and, um, and my questions are um, similar to some that have already been asked, but I will try to go further. And uh, I'm not a specialist of uh, bitumen. I come from polymer science. So uh, I know a few things about bitumen rheology, but uh, when it goes to pavements and uh, uh, this kind of material where you have all the granulates, uh, it's a bit out of my uh, domain. So my question will be maybe a bit naive. Uh, so you, you observe that uh, in the, the lower layers, uh, you have a, a faster um, aging. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, just before you were asked about what would be the parameters. And I was surprised that you didn't mention the, the static loading. Mm -hmm. Because you have a road, you have, a, of course, the traffic that you mentioned, which is the dynamic loading. But in the lower layers, to, to my naive view, uh, maybe you have a higher uh, static loading than in the upper layers or not? And the, does this uh, static loading can be a, an important parameter for the aging? Is it static loading the, the weight itself of each? Yes, me mechanical stress. Oh. I thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> I 
it's very complicated because, for example, for us, we also try to evaluate the possible impact that traffic could have on on Richmond and also asphalt mix, which is why we always took uh, asphalt mixtures from uh, traffic and traffic flow because this would be the only uh, parameter that changed between these two. Mm -hmm. But to be honest, we couldn't draw any sound conclusions on that because we couldn't see any clear trend on that. So, I would say, I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, uh, one parameter that you mentioned is the, the presence of uh, oxygen, or oxidative species. Um, um, what is the, the, the origin of this oxy oxidative species, and especially oxygen? Do you think that it is uh, oxygen that is trapped during the, the layout of the different layers? Uh, and when you, or is it oxygen that comes after, or oxidative CC that comes after? I, my my idea is: Do these oxidative species, and especially oxygen, come from outside during the life of the the pavement? <laughs> or do they come from inside? <laughs> they were trapped at the beginning inside the material. Oxygen might be probably due to any chemical reaction from the material instead of okay. coming from uh, in, uh, environmental source, for example. Is that what? No, but I mean, when uh, at the beginning, when you uh, when you la you make the different layers, mm -hmm. you have the the bitumen is heated mm -hmm. to be freed and uh, mixed and. Uh, uh, when you make this mixing and uh, you put dif different layers, yes. you can trap oxygen in the layer mm -hmm. or not. Yes, yes. Well, uh, we, we always have some air that well, could be trapped in, in the air voids of our asphalt mix. And there's also, there, there, there could also be uh, a duration between the construction between one layer and the other layer where our asphalt mix will be more exposed to the atmospheric oxygen, for example. But, but yeah, oh. so I think that is pretty much the uh, the, uh, the interaction with oxygen. But since it, it always, since what we observed was seem, seemed to be more pronounced in the bottommost part of our structure, so there could also be other parameters that that was not taken into consideration. Mm -hmm. I mean, because, well, that, well, I would say that it, it's a bit naive as well to not consider that uh, the bottom part of our structure won't be uh, having uh, interactions with with the, what, 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 what whatever it has mm -hmm. in, in the bottom part of our structure. Okay. So I think that this really merits uh, further investigation. Intuitive, intuitively, uh, maybe I'm completely wrong, but I think if you have uh, air trapped during the fabrication of the different layers, the air trapped in the bottom layer will make take more time to uh, uh, escape. And maybe you can have some residual oxygen in the more residual oxygen in the lay in the the lower <coughs> layer than in the upper layers. Just uh, maybe. Uh, I have one question about the, the, your criterion, the MAI criterion. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there was one question uh, at the beginning of the, the session uh, about the link between uh, molecular mass distribution, which is a static, paramet static uh, uh, parameter, and the rheology, which is dynamic. Mm -hmm. uh, can you show the, the slide where you have the your MAI uh, parameter? So, okay. So uh, it's a fraction of uh, high molecular weight uh, species, yes. 
And uh, if I understand well, you 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 suppose that these high molecular weight species are um, uh, as asphaltins. Uh, yes. Yes. And uh, the asphaltins are, are molecules that are cross-linked, no? Asphaltin are big they, molecules. They are big molecules, but they, they are able to agglomerate to, to merge together. But I don't think that they are cross-linked as polymers. But okay. they have a rather solid behavior. Solid behavior. Yes. Yeah, they are this two final part. It's the key. Yeah, so, so it's not only a, a fraction of uh, high molecular weight. It's also a fraction of uh, of uh, of um, components that yes. are have a solid behavior. Power. Yes. Mm. yes. So yeah. yeah. So uh, in in Tensofo's work, that's why he proposed this term afferent, because unlike polymers that have big long big molecules. Yeah, yeah, I have no problem with that. <laughs> yes, it's just because we have association here. The the point where I want to uh, to uh, to to go is uh, you you have uh, you find that. Uh, uh, if you have a MAI, so a fraction of uh, this high molecular weight and mm -hmm. uh, supposedly asphalt and uh, solid particles, a uh, fraction is uh, when you go above 0 0.58, mm -hmm. you, have, you begin to have a failure. Mm -hmm. It's your failure criteria. Uh, when I see uh, these, uh, these kind of numbers uh, around 0 0.6 as a polymer, as a polymer scientist, I I think about percolation. Mm. It's percolation? Gelation. Ah. Gelation yes. or percolation phenomenon. Ah, yeah, yeah. gelation, yes. Because if you have a, a more or less solid particle, it's a sulfaltens, and you reach a certain uh, volume fraction yeah. around 0 0.6, you can have a percolation of these solid particles, and that could explain the change of uh, Mechanical behavior and failure. So maybe what what do you think of that? Yes, well, this was actually one of the hypotheses that that we were working on. Um, okay. The possible solid gel transition that could probably happen at around 0.58. So yeah, I, I'm very glad that seeing that it's in line with <laughs> some sort of polymer science. <laughs> very nice. And finally, I will have a last question, uh, which is more open. Uh, uh, bitumen uh, is a commodity material, very large scale use, but in the future it may become uh, scarce. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, there are many uh, research works. I show you where you have uh, colleagues, uh, PhD students that work on uh, alternatives to bitumen. And uh, these new materials will also have aging problems. And do you uh, do you think that uh, the approach that we, de we develop for bitumen could be easily applied and transferred to these new materials, or uh, is it completely different aging problems? Uh, but I think well, for, um, well, the, 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 the thing that I have at the top of my head about on this is that uh, since this approach is based on geology, and geology has been the property that We've been using to, to, to characterize the performance of, uh, of our asphalt material, uh, not only asphalt material, but any other binding material. So I think this, this approach could also be useful since we, we're clearly just relying on a geological property, such as the base angle mm -hmm. parameter. So I think, well, we, we could try and we could see well, if, if it's uh, feasible or not, technically feasible or not. Yes, I don't have much knowledge on other alternative binders. <laughs> yeah, because in, in your, uh, your uh, perspectives for future work, you mentioned uh, working on other bitumen, and, uh, mm. but uh, maybe an, an important thing is, to s is the, the applicability of this kind of method to other materials. Yes. Or it would be nice, also, or it would also be nice to have more different types of bitumen to integrate our data sets and then we probably well, we could probably have a more representative analysis of the uh, 
That's what the market is based on. Well, you know, the one here in France or in any other region, depending on the piece of the integrated salary data sets. Okay. Um, so I have no more questions. Uh, before uh, giving uh, floor to the, your supervisors, who I uh, highly am uh, very grateful to have invited me for this uh, jury. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to ask if someone in the audience has a question. <laughs> Maybe you can just say a word. Uh, it's not a question, <laughs> but uh, I was uh, the, at the origin of the mobility project. I proposed the mobility project, and really, I'm very happy to see that what we imagined that we could uh, understand better the mechanisms of aging and find some parameters. Uh, to, to characterize the, the, the decrement has been possible, especially in, uh, in the physics of Rodrigo. And I think he contributed really a lot to the, to the project. And so thank you for that. And I think uh, from the different theses that I have followed, it's really one of the theses where you have most re results, both experimental results and uh, new methods and proposals of new, new, new methods. So for me, it's really very, 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 very good work. Congratulations for that. And my idea is that now, uh, what is interesting is that your method can be applied relatively easily because you only need to have a rheological characterization of the bitumen, of the bitumen, is to try to use it for different uh, payments and to try to establish bet a better link between your indicators and the state of uh, deterioration or the, the, the condition of the, of the pavement. And so you propose a, a limit of uh, 0 0.58, but I imagine that if we apply it to different materials, we can maybe find a, a better uh, Better characterization, maybe different, uh, different uh, levels, and maybe uh, the, the, the the final dream was a little bit what uh, what Cedric was uh, was uh, saying was to understand the contribution of uh, chemical aging and the contribution of damage to the to, to the condition of the material. We didn't really succeed yet because it's complicated, but uh, the, the final objective would be also to be able to, to understand the contribution of aging and the contribution of, uh, of damage. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. So now, uh, uh, Meilan, if you want to say a few words, and ask questions if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Of course, I have any questions. I would like to add some additional information to highlight the qualities of uh, the PhD project come up with a new uh, methodology to try to understand the aging phenomenon which is a fundamental phenomenon and uh, I remember at the beginning uh, there was a question uh, that uh, everybody has realized uh, this uh, phenomenon a uh, long time ago, what we could find uh, more or understand more. So the work from rule uh, so we can find uh, and we can understand more mechanism behind this phenomenon. And, uh, as you can see, uh, Woodrow had a uh, uh, very good quality of uh, presentation and writing. He had uh, published already three papers and two other uh, uh, and, and away. So we are very happy uh, uh, for that. And uh, uh, of course, uh, the, 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 the supervising team and uh, every uh, colleagues can understand Rodrigo had a very good communication uh, skill uh, uh, that he
he can uh, work with uh, uh, different colleagues in the library and also in uh, international. He exchanged with international researchers, exchanged with uh, technicians in the, in the lab, with the uh, researchers in the lab to, uh, to understand more on the uh, experimental uh, studies and also on uh, statistical analysis. Uh, not mention the, the other name. And uh, so, uh, of course, uh, we are uh, working on fundamental questions. So we, we have uh, put a methodology to study the, the main uh, fundamental uh, parameter. Uh, in the future, we can do some uh, parametric uh, study to understand the, the RAP effect, the, the, damage uh, and uh, with uh, we have the idea to study the traffic and traffic zone uh, but with the methodology uh, put in place we can we can do this more and uh, uh, there are a lot of things but uh, one of the questions from Cyril for, for example to study uh, or to uh, what parameter to uh, we can use as an input to model the Asian phenomena. Uh, I think we can, uh, based on this work, and uh, try to do uh, with uh, uh, control aging processor like uh, the one developed in, in VN, VN aging processor with a very controlled uh, input parameter of a, a fixed aging, uh, uh, not oxygen, but uh, uh, with a fixed uh, control parameter that's so that we can model that and we can for example for doing a, a an appropriate uh, characterization test uh, the TSRST that is a tentative to try to to show that there's a ring between the mechanical behavior in the mix and with the with the binder but uh, for example in EPD they develop a, a fatigue test uh, during the fatigue test they they did uh, uh, complex modulo stats, mm. so we can track uh, the evolution of the phase angle uh, with the ship uh, parameter, uh, for example, to, to, to understand. And so that's uh, some additional information to highlight the different qualities of the protocol. And so we are very happy to pass a uh, very, uh, I'll say, uh, extraordinary adventure together. Thank you. Thank you very much. And last but not least. <laughs> so thank you very much, Rodrigo. It's almost the end of the story. I remember when uh, we met three years ago <laughs> at three o'clock in the morning <laughs> after uh, a conference uh, dinner at the Pirata Bar. Yeah. You speak uh, with me in French. Yes. <laughs> it was uh, un unexpected for me, <laughs> for, for, for me. And uh, after we decided to uh, to uh, make this story together uh, and with Pierre also, because uh, in fact here we are two supervisors, but Pierre <laughs> was also a supervisor uh, because he he leads the Move the Odyssey and Move the Odyssey project. So the story uh, um, as a start, so the, at uh, the Pirata Bar, uh, after the Pirata Bar. <laughs> but and after three years of very intense work, uh, I don't know if you understand, but how many experiments have been done, has been done yes, uh, to cut the sample at Strasbourg, at Dijon, uh, to, uh, to, extract the to extract the binder, uh, to test after the binder. And, uh, I must say that um, uh, Rodrigo is very well organized, and uh, uh, congratulations for that, because it was not, not easy. Uh, another thing I want to uh, point out is uh, what we have done during the lockdown, yes. because we have a long lockdown where it was forbidden to go in the laboratory, and, and it was a, um, an experimental thesis also. It was difficult. So we have passed a long time huh? each week 
by Zoom to, to work together. We have worked a lot on model parameter. It is not in the thesis, but we have passed perhaps several months to try to define a, uh, a model using the 2S2P1D model parameter. It was impossible. It's why we, we, we come back to the, this uh, statistical analysis to understand what, uh, what uh, becomes the shape of this uh, path angle curve uh, during NJ. Well, lots of details. So I just want to thank you uh, for all this work. Uh, uh, of course, there are still some questions. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, we, uh, but your work will be very important for the, I think, for the future. Of, uh, to estimate the residual life of actual pavement made of bitumen. So to answer to, to Eric, the actual pavement are made with bitumen. Uh, and, and it is uh, the goal of this, uh, this thesis and uh, the residual life of actual bitumen. Okay, so I don't want to be uh, too long. Thank you very much. Rodrigo, see Roma. <laughs> well, thank you very much. So now the jury will uh, leave the room. Mm. Okay, and we come back. <laughs> Well, uh, so Mr. Uh, Siroma, uh, Rodrigo, um, all the members of the jury agree that you deserve the title of doctor in civil engineering. So congratulations. But uh, the jury would like to add a few things. Uh, so you will be doctor in civil engineering, but uh, it is clear for us that uh, your uh, expertise is not limited to civil engineering. It includes uh, expertise in uh, chemistry, rheology, uh, statistical analysis. Uh, and so it's much more multidisciplinary than that. Um, the jury particularly uh, liked your uh, presentation, which was uh, sometimes like a lecture, uh, particularly for the statistical analysis, which was uh, less clear in your manuscript. So uh, you were able to, uh, to present it very, very clearly so that anybody, any non-specialist of this uh, domain can understand. And it was clear to us that uh, you are able to discuss and exchange uh, ideas with uh, specialists from very different communities. Um, regarding your answers to the questions, they were uh, sound and honest, and you took time to uh, give uh, uh, clear uh, answers and um, uh, not evading the potential limitation of so some uh, results. And uh, this was really appreciated by the jury. And um, in the end, what we can conclude is that you have, uh, you have uh, all the skills, scientific, but also in communications and um, necessary for a career in science uh, and engineering. Uh, may it be in the industry or uh, in the academics. So uh, we wish you uh, a nice uh, scientific career wherever you go after that. Congratulations. It's really the end of this um, three year of work hard, but also uh, that's where I could discover this magical and fantastic work that is well, asphalt nature related research. 
So I'd like to thank you all for being here. I'd like to thank Mme. Gary Limouillet and also Mr. Gahako for, for your review. Uh, I could get so many insightful, um, so many uh, valuable insights from them and possible uh, things that I could improve in a future work. Also, I'd like to extend all my gratitude to all the examinators, from Monsieur Lua, Monsieur Commandant, uh, Monsieur Sosia, and uh, Steve Shalom. Steve Shalom, uh, sorry. Uh, he was. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Steve Shalom, who was being part of who was being part of my community TV, so he was also one of the. The people that I also found in Fortaleza, and I was also really glad to have him with us as well. With, um, I'd like to express my heartful great um, gratitude to, to my advisors, uh, in my and my dad, and also Pierre. Pierre was also my an advisor, even though officially, but he was there for me whenever I I needed the most. So thank you all three for the value three. Well, without your guidance, this work wouldn't be done the same. Merci. Euh, je je m'aime bien aussi euh, merci euh, maintenant <rire> à ma famille. Désolé, je vais passer au portugais maintenant. Bon, obrigado, obrigado, Cécile. Obrigado pour vous faire venir ici. Obrigado à, obrigado mãe, à mim pour ta mãe, pour tout le monde qui est avec nous dans le Brésil. Tem sido três anos. Distante do país, tem sido bem difícil, mas hoje, graças a Deus, eu consegui chegar. E eu gostaria também de agradecer a, a Sandra, minha esposa, que está aqui, porque ela é a pessoa que me acompanha desde, desde a, da, da faculdade de engenharia até aqui. Então, se eu estou aqui também, grande parte é graças a você. Obrigado. É, me assiste tudo.